multiple sclerosis is a disease. It's not the main thing in your life. You're not living for multiple sclerosis. It's just one of the things in your life. This is Dr. Olga Tone. Hi, I'm Olga rosenwald Tone, and I'm a neuroimmunologist at Drexel University. And she's right. Multiple sclerosis is only a disease. It's just one small part of your life, not a lifestyle. And that's how Dr. Tone thinks about MS when she's treating patients who suffer from it. Since it's a disease, like life trumps disease at any point, right? And our goal as physicians is truly to improve their quality of life. She's absolutely right here. So on this week's installment of the Brainways podcast, Dr. Tone was kind enough to join me to discuss these and other important issues that are faced by patients with MS, and in particular, issues that are faced by women with MS. In 2016, Dr. Danielle Becker joined me for a somewhat related discussion on issues that are faced by women who suffer from epilepsy. Estrogen starts with an E, and E stands for exacerbation. So when estrogen is high, it is more likely that they will have an exacerbation in their seizures. Progesterone starts with a P. We recently remastered that show for you this past spring, but today we'll be shifting gears and we'll explore a few similar gender issues that are faced by women with multiple sclerosis. As I'm sure you know, MS is a disease which preferentially affects women. It's three times more common in adult women than adult men. The earliest symptoms typically manifest at the most inopportune time in their lives, when they're just getting their careers off the ground or they're planning on growing a family. (laughs) And this is only made worse by the fact that the treatment for this condition comes with its own risks to the pregnant and the postpartum woman, all of which may influence a patient's decision to even have children. There's so much to think about, and so many things that we often don't think about. But hopefully, after today's program, you'll leave us knowing what these issues are and what they may mean for your patient. I'm Jim Sigler for Brainwaves. Stay with us. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. What I want to start off with is a case. I think that thinking through this in the form of a case kind of really uh, solidifies the concept and the framework of how you manage a patient who comes with multiple sclerosis uh, and the issues that are faced, particularly by women. So let's say you have a 21-year-old woman who comes to your office a month after having her first episode of optic neuritis. On further workup, she also has two subcortical white matter lesions and CSF with three oligoclonal bands. She was given a clinical diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, and she's treated with three days of corticosteroids, and she was told to follow up in your office. So now she's here in your office. She's worried. She's got tons of questions. First, what is it about women that just predisposes them to to this condition? Right. That is a very good question and probably has a lot to do with uh, what is the etiology of multiple sclerosis, uh, which to this point we still do not know. What we know is that it is a chronic demyelinating inflammatory disorder that affects women much more than men and currently at about a three to one ratio. It seems that the ratio of women to men, it kind of really emerges after puberty. Absolutely. Yeah. So not just the ratio seems to have to be a little bit closer for men to women uh, when they present with multiple sclerosis at a younger age. But also we have noticed that across time, the rates of multiple sclerosis, uh, the ratio of multiple sclerosis between women and men have had a higher disparity. So a good example. What Dr. Tone is referencing here is that not only is there a sex predilection for the development of multiple sclerosis, but it seems that this difference in overall risk of MS has only emerged in recent years, and it's only worsened over time. According to data from the National Multiple Sclerosis Society in the 1940s, women were just as likely to develop MS as were men, a one-to-one ratio. Now, that ratio is more like three-to-one, and it's probably growing. It also varies with latitude, so at higher latitudes, there is an even higher prevalence of women compared to men, and what really seems to have happened... I'll say that. Experts still don't know why that is. It could be related to environmental or epigenetic risk factors, but there may also be a strong publication bias that drives this association. Factors, And one theory is that maybe some of those environmental risk factors might be playing different roles in women. For example, the conversion of vitamin D or the sunlight exposure might just be different and behave differently in women when compared to men. Uh, some of the HLA, when you're thinking more of like genetic risk factors, might also play a different role in women compared to men. Uh, but the truth is that beyond that, we're not entirely sure. A few other... Some have also hypothesized that the specific body fat content in women compared to men 
may also contribute. And epidemiologic studies have identified a twofold higher risk of MS patients who have become obese before their 18 to 20 years of age. Then there are other disparities in the disease prevalence and severity of MS. While it is more common in women, the disease behaves a little differently when compared to men who are affected. Women usually have a not as aggressive or not as disabling disease as men do. Compared to women, I'm sorry to say guys, men with MS are more likely to have progressive disease as opposed to the relapsing remitting disease. We have poor recovery after attacks and more rapid progression of disability over time. Then there's an ethnic difference in the outcome of MS. So Caucasians usually have lower amount of disability compared to other ethnicities, especially uh, African Americans. And lastly, as you'd expect, because MS is a multifocal central nervous system disorder, the prognosis is going to be highly dependent on the lesion burden and the lesion location. How many of those lesions are infratentorial or in the spinal cord versus those supratentorial lesions? And just thinking of those infratentorial and spinal cord lesions usually having a higher amount of accumulated disability over time. That all being said, you still have this young woman in your clinic. To her, it doesn't matter what her haplotype is or whether she lives in New York City or Austin, Texas. She still has MS, and she's here to be treated. Here's what Dr. Tone prefers to do. Uh, this is exactly how I usually see my patients, right? Either after a hospitalization or after they present it to the PCP's office. So usually what I try to do is I split that first visit into two. On this first visit, we're going to talk about what is multiple sclerosis, what is my impression that the one, they actually have multiple sclerosis or do we need more diagnostic evaluation, prognosis? And then once they have some time to digest all of this information, we're going to take the second appointment, which will be sooner, very soon after this initial one, to discuss how to prevent uh, new lesions, uh, the use of disease-modifying therapy when it's indicated. So first visit, we're establishing care, talking about what is multiple sclerosis, how it happens, what testing remains and the course of the disease, relapsing remitting, primary progressive, and so on. No treatment yet. Then the patient comes back for follow-up, and that's when treatment decisions are made. What would you want to start this patient on? Right. So, uh, as, as you know, there's no current guidelines, like a, like you know an organogram or like a three-line branch that will tell us which medication is appropriate for who and at which time. Uh, we do have some therapies that are more considered like first-line therapies versus other ones. And spe specifically when you're thinking of more higher-risk therapies like Tysabri of Alent or Alentuzumab wouldn't usually be your first choice. Uh, but the main reason why we don't have those guidelines is that it's really very much patient-based. So while someone that is the single provider on a home of, of a family might be extremely concerned about the safety of the drugs, Someone else that is, has exactly the same background might be more concerned about the efficacy and preventing disability. Which is exactly why Dr. Tone has her first visit with the patient to discuss the risk of the disease progression in that particular person and why Dr. Tone emphasizes a personalization to treatment rather than a cookie cutter standardization of care, which I really like a lot. If this 21 year old woman is planning on becoming, has just got married and is planning on becoming uh, pregnant within the next two years, that might certainly affect my decision of which DMT am I going to use for her. I'm usually going to explain a few efficacy options within the DMTs that I think that might be more appropriate for this person, uh, and then add that to the side effects uh, as well as the safety profile uh, for each one of those drugs. So, based on the patient's age, the risk of progression, white matter burden, and so on, Dr. Tone may recommend a particular class of drug. And usually the way that I like to think about this is splitting those disease-modifying therapies into the older ones, which are usually the injectable medications, versus the newer ones, which are the higher, usually higher efficacy, but also orals as well as infusions. In a young woman with seemingly low risk and less aggressive disease, Dr. Tone might recommend the patient start on one of the platform therapies the injectables, either an interferon or glutarum or acetate. The most important thing to mention here is how often those are going to be dosed because it can vary from every other day with beta serum to once a week of Avonex and every couple of weeks of Plagridi. But let's say this young woman is considering pregnancy. Dr. Tone might prefer glutarum over one of the other interferons. We have 20 plus years of safety data since it was uh, first came into the market in 1995. Uh, so we know it's not going to give you cancer. It's not going to be associated with any other problems in the long term. 
and it's the only one of the currently available MS drugs that is pregnancy category B, which means animal data has shown no fetal harm, but there is insufficient human safety data. And Dr. Tone is choosing this regimen based on the patient's risk profile and disease activity. In this particular patient, she might not jump straight to the more potent but potentially riskier therapies. I haven't heard that she had like 15, 20 lesions or that she only had one clinical relapse of the optic neuritis, so I'm not thinking yet about those higher efficacy regimens. I'm still thinking of the, the ones that I know more about. Drugs that have relatively decent safety profiles. And for the most part, when it comes to the platform therapies, we're talking about local site reactions, redness, pain, injection welts, or more rarely liver function abnormalities or allergic reactions. But some patients aren't as worried about safety. They're thinking, I just want to get ahead of the disease. What are the strongest therapies that I can take? And I'm never going to give them more than four options, right? They will be completely disoriented. And there's a, there's a reason why there's a physician telling them about the option, because it's your job to tailor which ones make more sense for each patient. And at that point, through the conversation, she's already going to give me the cues that she does not want an injectable. And then I'm going to cut that speech right in there and then jump into the orals. Versus if I start getting a sense from her questions that regardless of how many lesions or what was the prognosis that, that I was discussing with her right in the beginning, that she's really much more interested in efficacy and doing the best drug that is available, then I'm probably going to jump a little higher up and focus more on things like Jelenia or even Ocrelizumab uh, right on. So it's, it's unfortunate that we tend to see these patients come in, they're women, they're young, and they're of childbearing age, childbearing potential, who come in with the first episode of a clinically isolated syndrome or radiologic event, and now they have clinical symptoms, and that's when they need the treatment or need to initiate treatment, uh, but they're planning to have a family. They want to have children. When you're counseling a patient on pregnancy and medications that you could offer during pregnancy, how does that conversation go? This is such a good point. And uh, so first of all, for any of those situations, either thinking of getting pregnant in five years versus thinking of getting pregnant and stopping their medication within the next three months, usually what I start by telling them is that multiple sclerosis is a disease. It's not the main thing in your life. You're not living for multiple sclerosis. It's just one of the things in your life. Life trumps disease at any point, right? And our goal as physicians is truly to improve their quality of life. One of the most encountered issues by women that are considering motherhood, they're con considering starting to try to conceive, is actually the social stigma that they will expect that both their families as well as their husbands as well as the physicians will usually give them a hard time and tell them to not get pregnant. This kind of surprised me. What Dr. Tone is talking about here regarding the stigma of MS, well, there are two issues. First, Dr. Tone recognizes that a woman may not be fully transparent with their physicians, which is obviously a bad thing, because they're afraid that the physician will give them bad news. The doctor may say something like, pregnancy is bad for their disease, or it'll make it worse. They'll tell the patient something like, why would you ever try to have a kid in your condition? Is the disease going to become a problem when I try to get pregnant? Or maybe the patient's already noticed some physical changes, and these changes have begun to interfere with their family life. Uh, a few things that might come into play, and especially when the disease has already advanced a little more and there's a higher EDSS, there's a higher expandisability scale uh, for this person, is that there might be some, some level of sexual dysfunction, vaginal dryness, or for men, trouble with ejaculation, for example. Uh, those issue might, issues might come into play when people are starting to talk about reproduction. Some of these issues can be treated supportively. And on the whole, I don't think anybody out there is going to say, don't try to get pregnant, don't live your life, especially not Dr. Tone. For any woman, even before they start trying to get pregnant, I say, you know, in life will go on. And at some point, we're going to be talking about getting pregnant. And, uh, and I'm here for you. Please come to me because this, this will be discussed. Along that same line of thinking, Dr. Tone has also found that many women worry that pregnancy could have a bad outcome for the baby. And for this, they may try to avoid growing their family. And there is some merit to this concern, I've got to be honest. The risk of MS in a child who's born to a mother with MS is 10 to 30 times greater than the risk of MS in a child born to a mother without MS. 
but it's still a low risk. It's not like there's a very high genetic increase in the chances. It's a low absolute number, only two in a hundred chance. And we have such amazing treatment options nowadays that nobody should ever use this to justify why a patient with MS shouldn't conceive a child. And when you look at, for example, uh, monozygotic twins, the general rate is about 25% of correlation of both having MS. But obviously, when you look at women, it goes a little bit higher to about 34%. Now, this 34% refers to the risk of a child having MS who's born to a mother with MS, whose monozygotic twin also has MS. And compare this to the risk of MS in a child born to a father with MS, whose monozygotic twin also has multiple sclerosis, a risk of only 7% versus the 34%. So there is still a huge effect driven by the parent of origin, with women significantly driving this relationship. The other side of the coin is, for the patient who's not ready to get pregnant, or who wants to commit to one of the more efficacious MS therapies, you as the physician have got to be vigilant about pregnancy and contraception counseling. So as neurologists, we're not usually very comfortable or very used to talk about contraception, but I still get shocked with the data that about 40% of the pregnancies worldwide and up to 50% of the pregnancies in the United States are unplanned. And this is huge, right? You guys can't, but I can see your face here and it's yeah, it's shocking. It's shocking face. So uh, for someone, and even if you look at the data from those clinical trials, more recently the, the data from ocrelizumab during the clinical trials, there were women getting pregnant during the clinical trial. It, it happens. Life happens. So it, it is, it should be part, just like you counsel someone on migraine prophylaxis with topiramate, just like you, will, you should counsel them about the teratogenic effect. I will always start by counseling them on the importance of contraception and a reliable method of contraception. So if you're a 21-year-old woman, uh, doesn't feel very up to taking a oral birth control every day, then an IUD might be the best choice here. This is because many of the drugs that we use in MS have proven to be harmful to fetal development. Fingolimod, the sphingosine receptor modulator that sequesters lymphocytes, can be embryonic lethal, or it can lead to persistent trunculus arteriosus or ventricular defects. Teraflunamide, or Abagio, which inhibits pyrimidine synthesis and is pregnancy category X, is embryo lethal, or it could cause major cranial and vascular birth defects. Dimethyl fumarate, Tecfidera, is also embryo lethal and can cause skeletal and cranial defects. So it's imperative that these risks be discussed with the patient and a solid birth control plan be adopted in order to prevent fetal harm or demise especially for a patient on teraflunamide or abagio. If it were to happen, so let's say she is on abagio, she has been on abagio for a little while, now she comes to me and she says, oops, I am pregnant. Then I would use either activated charcoal or oral colostermine. You'd basically try to bind the agent or you try to reduce the absorption. Your goal here is to make sure that they have nearly completed eliminated teriflonamide. So you give them activated charcoal or oral cholesteramine, and then you would dose them to see if the level of teriflonamide in the serum is still higher than 0.02 micrograms. And if that is the case, then you would repeat the dose. I want to circle back on a topic that we briefly mentioned a moment ago regarding the stigma of multiple sclerosis. The thought that some women may have that their condition could get worse with pregnancy and that there really aren't many great treatment options for that year or more when you're trying to conceive. Most patients are ultimately recommended to discontinue their treatment because of the risk of fetal harm, especially with teraflunamide and monoxantrone. So there are two things to say about that. Uh, So we have good data at this point telling us that there is a very high likelihood that the disease is actually going to tune down uh, during pregnancy. The risk of relapses during pregnancy can drop by 50 to 70 percent, according to the prospective PRIMS observational cohort. And the risk is the lowest during the third trimester. So there is some sort of protective hormonal effect related to gestation. Unfortunately, this benefit is offset by the correction of the hormonal milieu after delivery. There is also good data telling us that most likely the postpartum period, and especially those first three months, is when the disease is going to be more aggressive, and then after that is going to come back to where it was before. The risk of relapses practically doubles in those three months postpartum. And there's no known treatment or way to prevent that kind of increased risk of relapse. Right. So we will go on a case-by-case basis. So for example, from this study, what they actually found was that this, this number was highly drifted by 
how active was the disease before pregnancy, how active was the disease during pregnancy, and what was the EDSS, that disability scale, at the time of conception. As a matter of fact, 72% of these women actually had no relapses on the postpartum period. It was really those ones that had a much less stable, well-controlled disease. So here the goal, again, individualized for those patients that have less well-controlled disease, a higher number of relapses near the time that they were thinking of getting pregnant, I might suggest that we should do a higher efficacy infusion. So for example, ocrelizumab would be a good choice, uh, especially... If it's the thinking here is that in a patient with poorly controlled disease before conception, that patient's still going to have a lower risk of relapses during the pregnancy period. However, that doesn't mean that they can't relapse. And postpartum, the risk of relapse is going to go up even more. So getting the disease under more control before conception by using aggressive and highly efficacious infusion therapies like ocrelizumab, alemtuzumab, or natalizumab may quiet the disease process down a bit and make the pregnancy a little easier for the patient, maybe even reduce the risk of relapses after delivery. And for other patients, they may not want to come off a disease-modifying therapy during pregnancy. And just like before, we have no formal guidelines on what to do here. Thinking of those categories of A, B, C, D, and X, right, with like A being safe in humans and animals and, and all the way to the other side of the spectrum, the X being there's a high chance of teratogenicity and that chance overweights the chances of benefits from the medication. There's only one that is category B, which is copaxone glutaramate acetate. Which is one of the once daily injectable platform therapies which has showed at least no evidence of teratogenic effects in humans or animals. Uh, there's also not a higher increase on abortions or miscarriages. Ideally, Jim, what I would say is to get off of a medication and try to stay off of DMTs during the time that they are attempting to conceive as well as during pregnancy. The time to stop the DMT will be one dependent on which DMT they're using. So for things that have a shorter half-life, so for example, dimethylformate, tacfidera, the half-life is one hour. So there is essentially no washout period. You can just stop taking the medication and then essentially on the next day start trying. Usually what I tell those patients is, is to wait for a week before they start trying to conceive. For a few other ones like glutyrame acetate or the interference, I might ask them to wait a few days, uh, and usually about a month. And for some of the other DMTs, depending on the half-life, the period will be a little longer. So for alentuzumab, it would be about four months, but it's one of those other high efficacy medications that you might consider as sort of like a getting them to be stable prior to actually, uh, to actually trying to conceive. For some couples, it should come as no surprise to you, planning a family can be a real challenge, and it may take months or years before a woman becomes pregnant. This situation may become particularly problematic for women with multiple sclerosis as they look into methods to optimize fertility. So first of all, I would tell them to go ahead because uh, regardless of multiple sclerosis, again, it's life trumping disease. Depending on how well they're doing with their disease, again, I might try to get them stable. Like if they'd say they're trying for two years, haven't really achieved no evidence of disease activity. And I might discuss like giving a one infusion of something before they try. The data that we know for in vitro fertilization is that there is a higher incidence on the annualized uh, relapse rate. And that uh, typically we're going to see that with the, with the GNRH agonists. And we're also going to see that with the failed IVFs. The thought, again, being that pregnancy will likely be protective, so specifically for these people that attempted the IVF, so had a higher amount of those hormones, and then the, there was a decrease because the pregnancy wasn't a success, we're going to see an increase in the relapse rate. Just to give you a sense of the relative risk, according to one 11-year observational study in France, 32 women underwent 70 in vitro fertilization attempts. The annualized relapse rate in the small cohort doubled from 0.7% per year to 1.6% per year and was independently associated with the GnRH agonists, like Dr. Tone said, and with failure of in vitro fertilization. In another prospective study of 16 women with relapsing remitting MS, assisted reproductive technologies increased the risk of relapses sevenfold, and they increased the radiographic disease ninefold. These were, again, driven by the GnRH agonists. So experts recommend patients be cautious when considering these treatment strategies, and perhaps to consider GnRH antagonists. Let's now say that the patient uh, successfully conceives. She's, you know, Yay. pregnant. It's great news. And she 
delivers. I mean, her she understands that the risk of having a kid who develops multiple sclerosis is very low. It's very low, but it's still higher than the average person. But now she wants to breastfeed and you really want to get her on a really aggressive therapy, especially in that postpartum period to prevent relapses. How do you counsel her on like, what's the safety of medications during breastfeeding and what to do next? Right. So there's, there's a good uh, guideline from the Anna Society as well as the FDA on safety during lactation for each one of those drugs. But the most important thing here is one, what is the patient wishes, right? Because if regardless of how well they're doing, they would like to continue breastfeeding, then what I might suggest is let's get a brain MRI right after delivery. We're going to do this one with contrast because now it's the timing after the delivery that we can finally do this that we have been holding off for at least the past nine months, right? And depending on those results, we might have their conversation of, I highly suggest we start a disease-modifying therapy versus it's safe to continue breastfeeding and waiting for a little longer. We kind of glossed over this, but the reason Dr. Tone says we might or we might not reinitiate a disease-modifying therapy at this point is because of the risks related to breastfeeding. Worth mentioning is that breastfeeding, like pregnancy itself, is associated with a reduction in the rate of relapses, about half of the expected risk. But these data are derived from observational studies, which could have been very biased. Maybe the effect observed in those studies was driven by women with milder disease who agreed to be included in the first place. Maybe these women thought, hey, My risk of relapses before pregnancy was low. I think I can hold off MS treatment for a few months while I try to breastfeed. Therefore, the risk of relapses that are observed in these studies would be lower. In contrast, mothers with more severe pre-pregnancy disease may feel like that they need to resume a disease-modifying therapy. Therefore, these higher-risk patients with more relapses would have been excluded. The high-risk patients wouldn't have wanted to participate in an observational study in which they would have had to abstain from MS therapy while breastfeeding. In a patient who you might feel is at high risk of relapses based on her pre-pregnancy disease state, or if you've got a patient who feels she's too nervous to continue abstaining from a disease-modifying therapy, sometimes Dr. Tone will treat them with intermittent pulses of high-dose corticosteroids. So specifically, solomadro might be one idea. And uh, I've had a few patients that we, what we have done was basically monthly steroids, monthly pulses of steroids. It is important to know that the solomadro spismethylprednisolone can can pass through breastfeeding, and one of the potential side effects is that it can cause immunosuppression on the neonate as well. Uh, so we would also go with the strategy of pump and dump. By pump and dump, Dr. Tone means the mother would pump her breast milk out and not use any of it to feed her kid. She would wait for the drug to wash out before allowing any recent breast milk to reach her newborn. All right. Now that we've covered many of the issues faced by women with MS before, during, and after pregnancy, let's return to our case, the young woman in her 20s that we began our show discussing. As you're following her over time, she's had a baby and she has no other plans to to get pregnant again. At what point do you escalate therapy? You know, like what threshold do you use to say, you know, we've tried this method, it doesn't work, or it is working, but not as well as I'd like it to, to work. Like, how does that conversation go? Right. Uh, right now, we have 13 therapies that are approved by the FDA in this country, uh, even more if you consider Europe, for the treatment of multiple sclerosis, and one that is approved for progressive disease. So the goal is NIDA, which is no evidence of disease activity, and by no evidence, I mean either clinical relapses or radiological changes. So typically, I'm going to keep a very low threshold to suggesting changing uh, disease-modifying agent. What is most often going to happen is that they're going to come to me with a baseline MRI that was done a couple of months ago when they were first, someone first suggested the diagnosis. Depending on the uncertainty we might have added, we will probably add a baseline MRI C-spine and thoracic. We may or may not do a lumbar puncture, depending on the questioning. And all of that will delay starting treatment a little bit, not to mention insurance approval, prioritizations, which will delay usually by another month or so. All these delays... The time it takes to get a complete baseline MRI of the neuroaxis, to have these initial visits, get the lumbar puncture, check for other labs, rule out conditions that could mimic multiple sclerosis, discuss treatment options and prognosis, finally select a therapy, get insurance approval. It's a lot of stuff. And by the time this happens and the patient's on their therapy, it may take a few weeks or months before the drug reaches its full effect. They come back in six months. Uh, And at this point, 
the patients already do for a repeat MRI and clinical assessment. If I find that they had a one new lesion, what do we do, right? Or what if you find two new lesions, or four? Or what if they had an episode of optic neuritis between your visits? Does this mean the drug you've only started isn't effective? Or is it that, during those weeks and months of delay, you haven't given the drug enough time to work? Medications like Opaxone, it takes about three months until they reach their, their full efficacy. Is it during the time that they weren't fully covered? So th- depending on how well they're doing in general and experiencing side effects, you know, already thinking about switching the medications for a number of other reasons, I might think differently. But usually if we decide to continue the same medication at that time because of that question, we're going to repeat again in six months. And then at that time, keep an incredibly low threshold for switching the medication because we have so many options, right? So just give it a tincture of time. So say she comes back and uh, she's been on Copaxone. She preferred Copaxone after having a kid and she's happy with the injection schedule. She has three new lesions 12 months later. Right. So that is the time that we'll have a conversation about the fact that maybe she had three new radiological lesions, but no clinical relapses, and how we know that the accumulation of those lesions might impact her disability in the longer term. So she might not be worrying so much about it right now, but in the future, it might have a very high impact, right? Yeah, three lesions a year sounds bad. Yeah, exactly. Terrible. So uh, we'll have a discussion about moving on to a higher efficacy agent at that time. It just seems so difficult to me to choose between 12 other different therapies. I mean, and I don't know if it's a lateral move, but I feel like going from clitirimer to Avonex really doesn't change the overall efficacy of the drug, but you want to step up from one of those platform therapies to either one of the infusions or one of the oral agents. Such, such a good point. So if the patient is very much attached to staying within one of those higher safety drugs, one of those platforms, like you were mentioning, the injectables, then it is perfectly reasonable to, to switch to this lateral move and go into the interference. The way that I think about this is that MS is such a heterogeneous disease that it's likely more than one disease within the same group. And while someone might respond very well to the mechanism of action of one medication, someone else might respond better to the other mechanism of action. Usually what I'm going to tell my patients right in the beginning to sort of like help set expectations and prevent frustrations in the future is there, it is a matching game. And sometimes uh, one medication is going to be very good for one patient, but not that great for the other. And we may switch through two or three medications until we find which one is the best for that patient. Let's take a minute and draw a comparison between MS and another neurologic disease. Let's say it's epilepsy or stroke which is more my kind of thing. Some patients with localization-related epilepsy do really well on oxcarbazepine, and others require escalating doses and second- or third-line agents. Two things worth mentioning here. In other neurologic diseases, in some cases, we'd consider adding agents on top of each other. Glucosamide in addition to oxcarbazepine, clobazam on top of glucosamide, or in stroke, clopidogrel in addition to aspirin. Low-dose rivaroxaban, in addition to antiplatelet therapy, as we've learned from the COMPASS trial. And the supplementation of drugs allows for complementary mechanisms of action that keep drug doses at lower levels, presumably reducing toxicity, while at the same time allowing for additive control over heterogeneous diseases. But this isn't what we do for patients with MS. Nobody's put on an interferon and alemtuzumab. We use steroids for relapses and continue the baseline background medication. But that's about it. So that's the first thing. Second thing is the theme of a failed treatment. No drug is perfect, not even ocrelizumab. Patients will have breakthrough seizures on levetiracetam or strokes through apixaban or MS relapses through alentuzumab. That doesn't mean that these drugs don't work. Often, we use these events as a catalyst to amend a patient's treatment plan. It feels like we're being proactive when we do this, and that we're doing good for the patient. Ultimately though, I think we're only treating ourselves. It feels like we're doing something in response to an aggressive disease, but who knows if this is the right thing. That's not to say you shouldn't do it. I mean, if there's a drug out there with higher efficacy and your patient has an aggressive disease, you could be totally justified to adjust a treatment. For MS, with more aggressive disease, more white matter lesions between scans or more clinical relapses, despite perfect compliance with one particular treatment, 
it makes sense to consider switching. Okay, so we have one last thing to talk about with this patient. So you followed her since she was 21 years old. Fast forward to 30 years in the future. Now she's going through I menopause. So. <laughs> yeah, and she's, she's doing relatively well. No, no significant disability. And you've been managing her and tried her on a couple of medicines. And you found out that she really likes Abagio. She does well with Abagio. You know, now she's coming to you and, and asking you about menopause and like the changes that she's going through now and how might that pose a risk to her. Right. If you go to one of those uh, European consortium meetings for multiple sclerosis, you see at least one table discussions about this. Like, So things to consider are how does menopause affect the course of disease? And two, once they have been stable for 20, 30 years, can we consider stopping the disease-modifying therapy? So specifically thinking of menopause, it can go both ways. It's unfortunately the period of time that the disease has also evolved for the next, let's say, 15, 20 years, and now it might be reaching that point of transitioning into the phase of secondary progressive, which they would no longer have the active relapses, but you would clearly see that the EDSS is worsening. You might be noticing that their gait is either getting slower and slower, or they're now, let's say, needing a cane for assistance during ambulation. There are other consequences of MS that begin to surface about this time, other than the risk of secondary progression, as Dr. Tone just mentioned. More cognitive impairment, mental slowing, depressive symptoms, fatigue, headaches, and a higher rate of osteoporosis than perimenopausal women without MS. And then all the expected symptoms of sexual dysfunction that come along with menopause. Unfortunately, when it comes to treating these symptoms with hormone replacement therapy, at this time, we don't have enough data to know whether it may improve or exacerbate MS. So we don't have good data about disease activity, but what we have is some questionnaires that were done a few years ago. And in those retrospective questionnaire studies, the women that were on replacement hormonal therapy had less involvement towards disability versus the ones that were not on hormonal replacement therapy. Also, getting back to our hormonal theory of the disease, the incidence of MS among women and men, the ratio of women to men who develop the disease, after about age 50, drops from that 3 to 1 that we saw in adolescence and young adulthood to about 1.5 to 1. But how do you manage a patient's MS through these years? Unfortunately, we don't have a crystal ball. We don't really have any guidelines on what to do when a patient's disease calms down or if it converts to a secondary progressive course. Since I don't have a crystal ball, I might suggest that if they're fairly stable and tolerating well their medications, they just continue it. I might start spacing out the MRIs, and especially if they are not taking a medication, like you mentioned, Obagio, uh, teriflonamide, that does not have a higher risk of PML, like some of the other oral agents. So in those cases, I might start spacing out the imaging for like every couple of years uh, instead of every year. Alternatively, the patient's disease may not progress, and maybe stopping the disease-modifying regimen can be discussed with the patient. Again, this all goes back to the main point Dr. Tone made at the beginning of the program, that each patient should be treated individually, and their interests should be considered when you're discussing the treatment options. As the show is coming to a close, I want to quickly highlight some of the issues that are faced by men with MS. Unlike women, as we mentioned earlier, men tend to present in later life, usually around middle age, 30s to 40s. And this may be related to the potentially protective effect of testosterone. The natural history of MS also appears to be slightly different for men compared to women. The duration from symptom onset to disability seems shorter for men, a finding that appears to be at least in part driven by the less robust responsiveness to immunomodulatory therapies in men, and also due to the higher propensity for primary progressive disease in men. Men also have more significant brain atrophy, and all of this for reasons that are incompletely understood. Because of this differential risk of progressive disease, Dr. Tone is a little more keen on unveiling any subtle symptoms of MS, disability, or progression of disease in her male patients. Just like in any other disorder, right, uh, typically men might have a tendency of not present the symptoms as uh, spontaneously as a woman uh, might present. So I might be a little bit more proactive about asking men about fatigue, sexual dysfunction, bowel or bladder symptoms, that they might not be freely mentioning it to me. And it could be as simple as uh, referring them to a urologist for consideration of medical treatment.
that's all we got for you on Brainwaves this week. Huge thanks go out to Dr. Olga Rosenbelt-Tone for joining me and sharing her experience in managing the broad spectrum of issues that come up with women who have multiple sclerosis. The program this week was produced by myself, Jim Siegler, and Olga Tone. Music was courtesy of Cellophane Sam, Chris Zabriskie, John Watts, Kai Engel, and Lee Rosevere. Sound effects by Mike Koenig and Daniel Simeon. As always, you can find Brainwaves on Twitter or Facebook at Brainwaves Audio and drop us a line sometime. Let us know what you'd like to hear on the show. I'm Jim Siegler for Brainwaves. Thanks for listening. Sorry, I got super nervous. No, you're doing great. (laughs) That was good. That was fun. Nice. That was fun. Yeah.